my name is Anthony Carpen, and I am your presenter, I guess, guest presenter for this Open Cambridge talk. And welcome to Anglia Russian University, which was one of our stomping grounds. So, anybody recognise any of the faces? Shout out some names for me, please. Mr. Herbert, let's start with you. Um, England Time Jeff, as one of the minority here who was a woman. I should say, uh, I'm delighted to have Councillor Lewis Herbert, who's one of my local councillors, who's also the leader of Cambridge Council, uh, with us. Any other names? Eva Hartree. Eva, Eva Hartree. So we've got Eva Hartree, who's this lady here, first woman mayor of Cambridge. Any other names? Florence Keynes. Florence A. Keynes, this lady. From just after she was married. But she did live to 96. Any others? Rosalind Franklin. No. <laughs> Rosalind Franklin. No, she's not up there. <laughs> <laughs> any other any other people think she should be? Yeah. Okay. Any others? Sir Philip Forster? No. No, she's not. Clara Beckham. <laughs> Surprisingly not. No. But we, she will be featured. Right, well, let's really get going. So, before we start, um, basically, the women that you were about to hear about are women who made the modern city that we know today. Without them, Cambridge would be a very, very different place. So, really, what I want you all to think about is remember their names, recognise their faces. Be inspired by their actions and follow their examples because Cambridge is changing um, as you can see all around us and actually I think it's incumbent on all of us to really get involved in the processes on how we shape the future of our city because the women that we're about to hear about did exactly that just over a hundred years ago and like I said created the city that we're familiar with today. And this tiny little challenge, which is what is the one small one action or one small behaviour change that you may want to make as a result of voting this weekend. You don't have to do it, but it's I'm just thinking I've got a room with over hundred people in here and what would it be like? So where did this all start? How many of you have been to the Museum of Cambridge? Show of hands. <laughs> It used to be called the Cambridge and County Folk Museum. And because they've got a cabinet full of photographs, and one of the photographs that they had was this place. Does so anyone know where that Playhouse Cinema is or was? Not Midland's Corner, but there was one. Who said Mill Road? Spot on. Now, unfortunately, in the late 1950s, central government, which I used to work for because my policy background is in the civil service, so I don't know where they bury the bodies, <laughs> raised the taxes on cinemas, and as a result, both the Tivoli and the Playhouse had to close because it was no longer economical to keep them running. And so we lost that facade. Where was it? Is it who said Sally Ann? <laughs> That's the Sally Ann building. And you can see some of that building is still there. And that is what a building that has had its soul ripped out looks like. And my heart broke as well. I just thought to myself, we just left that as, well, what's now the closed Sally Ann building. But if you look closely on the walls, you can see where the children of the day have completely dug holes in the brickwork with coins. Oh. And that's what gives it away the form of cinema. Um, and so I thought, well, what's the story behind this building? There must be more. I'm going through the photographs at the, uh, um, at the wonderful Museum of Cambridge, who have done wonders in helping me with this research. I came across this building. Anyone familiar with our old guild hall? Wow. That's before this new? That's before the current guild hall. How do you describe that, ladies and gents? Shout out. Small. Neoclassical. Neoclassical. Some said small. 
again, it's your description, it's how, uh, how you describe it. Um, I got this image from Fons Chamberlain's website. Fons is named after the Fons, literally. Um, and he does a wonderful amount of work on bringing a lot of our local history uh, online uh, and to people who might uh, otherwise bypass it. So I thought, actually, what's the story behind this, uh, this old building and how did we get to oh, it could work for me? I didn't get that. <laughs> <laughs> Messrs. Peck and Stevens Architects in the 1850s. The 1800s were a fascinating century for Cambridge. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the local historian Alan Brigham? It's yeah. Town of Not Gowns, or Splendid. For those of you who are not, I strongly recommend his Town of Not Gowns, or he is, I think, the, one of the few people, a few local historians, who actually does walking tours. Um, all about the history of Cambridge, the town. And the, like I said, the work that he's done has been absolutely splendid. And he can tell you all about how Cambridge developed throughout the 1800s. As a town, we were, we had a population of about 9,000 in the year 1800. We were 40,000 by the turn of the century, 1900. So the town expanded by four times over, which is far greater than the expansion um, we're experiencing now as a proportion. And it was in the middle of that time that they thought, right, okay, we need a proper right. grand, yeah, exactly, grand town hall. <coughs> Did we get this? <laughs> Got half of it. <laughs> we got, yeah, exactly. We got the back half, which is kind of like this bit. So the large hall that you see in the Guild Hall today is that back half. Um, and it was the work of the town clerk, Charles Henry Cooper, who was actually one of the greatest men um, in Cambridge's history, who chronicled much of our town's history as a big list, um, who actually got us um, that design. So then, another architect, William Wilmer Fawcett, basically said, let's get rid of that small photograph that you've seen, and let's have something like this. What do you think councillors said in the early 1890s about this? Too expensive. Yes. 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 Councillor Herbert said too expensive. Any additions on too expensive? Much too expensive. Much too expensive. <laughs> Any others? It was not grand enough for us. That's not at all, isn't it? And actually, the newspaper archive, the British newspaper archive online, and for those of you who are really interested in local history, do get a subscription to it. They actually said the council debate basically said, actually, let's vote for more money for a better design. And that's what they did, because that, they said, was not grand enough. And notice, actually, the design is very, very narrow, because you've still got the additional building to the side. And you can remember that one, and the councillors basically said, no, let's spend more money on that. John Morley, another local architect, came up with this one, and again, it's very, very narrow because that building next to it is still there. Um, but I don't know the story of what we can get, um, get that one. And then John Belcher came up with this design for Sir Horace and Ida Darwin, who were mayor and mayoress of Cambridge 1896 um, the, one of the most influential couples um, in town for a whole host of reasons in that time. Um, and I actually take all the questions to the city council basically saying, please can we get an improved version of that for the front of the Guildhall mm. to celebrate the centenary of the mayoralty of Florence Cades. So I think that's work in progress, isn't it, Councillor? <laughs> <laughs> Along with the Market Square, yes. Along with the Market Square, yes. Um, any thoughts on that design? Two, two, two. Wow. I'd like to wait for that first name. And why do you think we didn't get this one? Expensive. 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 Any elaborations on too expensive? Perhaps they didn't want to pull the building down. Because, uh, it's gone. Well, the reason was to do with finance. We were building so many things at the time, including what is now, anybody thinks of the Museum of Technology? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Came to Museum of Technology, that was um, originally, what was it originally? Sewage Works and Pumping Station. We were paying so much money for that. Because and, and, we, and all our waste went there as well. 
Yeah. And also, <coughs> one of the conversations, it was getting proper sewage and sanitation throughout the whole town. We were digging up all the roads, and it was costing a fortune. And so Sir Horace Darwin and fellow councillors said, well, okay, if we can't get this passed through the council, we'll have a referendum. <laughs> So they had a referendum on freight payers, and guess what happened? No. <laughs> no. Sorry. Um, and still haven't learned that lesson. So this was an, another really interesting design that um, came up in the, the archives. For those of you who are, how many of you are familiar with the Cambridgeshire collection? Mm -hmm. Right, so for those of you who are not, it's on the third floor of the Central Library up in Lion Yard. Do go there and ask them to see all of the pictures of the Guildhall because I've actually taken the scans and pictures of these and then printed up on A2 paper, photo paper, and given them back so you can actually see all of these things in detail. So we have all of these buildings, but then when I went through the British newspaper archive, I kept on finding the names of various people cropping up. Melissa well, Garrett Fawcett. Anyone not familiar with her? No, we've got a couple of people who are not familiar with her. Um, that's not a criticism or a bad thing. That's perfectly understandable. We have people in this room from all over the world, and there's no reason why they should be. Melissa Garrett Fawcett, um, in recent news, is famous for. What's it called? The vote. The vote. Yeah. And this is the statue of her courage calls to courage everywhere and she was one of the major figures behind the Votes for Women movement but it wasn't just the Votes for Women movement she was also central to um, a lot of work um, improving all things Cambridge and she was also one of the co-founders of Newnham College. This lady here, do we recognise her? Yes that's Florence A. Keynes with Andrew Manor Clough who was one of the other principles of said college. Now, the great thing about Newnham and Girton is being the first two colleges that were exclusively for women in Cambridge, is the early graduates of those colleges, um, <coughs> although they're not graduates of the University of Cambridge, because the chaps basically said, no, you're women, you don't deserve to graduate there as chaps. Um, they stuck around, they stayed in Cambridge, and they married. And rather than sitting around making lace and things like that, they said, no, we're going to overhaul this place because we can see the problems on our doorstep. And that's what many of them did. They sunk their teeth into their campaign teeth into the very real social problems of the time. So this lady rocked up. Anyone from the United States of America? I've got a couple of people here. Um, you've got a number of predecessors here who did great things for this city. And again, it's people like Caroline Slemmer, who was one of the women who came back, I'd say her family originally, her uh, ancestors, went from England to the United States, and then she came back. And her husband, Adam, was a lieutenant general in the US Army during the American Civil War and was widely regarded as one of the heroes of that conflict um, uh, for the North. And unfortunately for him, he died very, very young, only aged 40. And so Caroline was a widow aged 28. And so um, Caroline came to Cambridge at the invitation from one of her relatives and ended up marrying a classics professor, uh, <coughs> Sir Richard Jebb. And so, as his wife, she absolutely transformed the social scene, which was very, very awkward, if I can put it that way. And she was one of the people who was influential in getting the women, the women of Cambridge in, if we put it this way, high society to transform the town. And again, I think if we didn't have Carriage in Cambridge <coughs> in the late 1800s, Cambridge would be a very, very different place. Because you just had that energy and that spark 
um, that many contemporaries of her time like that, and also just uh, um, an incredible pair of eyes which dazzles the men. I think one of the legends is that um, when she first arrived, she had um, three proposals in one day. <laughs> Turned them all down. Um, we also have Elise Hopkins. Anyone know or have been to St Matthew's Church? <coughs> around the corner from here. <coughs> she was the person who raised most of the money for that. In fact, she raised so much money that they had a thousand pounds left over. So, 1860s time, thousand pounds is a lot of money. What are we going to build? And so, they went to the Cambridge Working Men's Club. Now, I think in the middle of Cambridge's slums, in Barnwell, they build one of the first social institutions where men can A, not drink alcohol, and we were properly sorted in those days. <laughs> East Road, Huntington Road, New Market Road, according to Edwin Sanjay, who we're going to hear about later, one pub every 25 meters. <laughs> yeah. and so, how have we got anything done? I have no <laughs> idea. Um, also, at the same time, we had um, Yolanda Marillion Stevens who was also changing the skylines. Now, the point here is that in the 1800s, there was a big push, um, again, if I put it this way, from the establishment to get Christianity back up and running. And um, Yolanda Marie Stevens was an heiress. She had married someone very, 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 very wealthy, I think known as one of the wealthiest commoners um, in the country at the time. And so she spent a huge amount of the fortune that she inherited on the big Catholic church on the corner of Hills Road. The one with the very, very big steeple, she paid for it. But it's actually quite a tragic story for her because um, in her early years, she's from France. And um, her mother basically sold her into prostitution at one of the um, ballets. And she was only so rescued by and um, Mr. Lynn Stevens, I think it's Edward, I think his first name was, um, <coughs> who persuaded her to become his spouse, basically, um, and take her out of that environment. When he died, and they died childless, she spent all of the money on things like churches and civic buildings. And so that's, one of, that's the reason why we've got this huge Catholic church. I think that's where I was baptised as a baby, um, and where my parents were married. Slap bang in the middle of town. Um, obviously, it wasn't popular with the local Protestants at the time, who were furious at the papists coming in and building this big monstrosity. But it's a very two star listed building now, so they can't touch it. And then these two little ones cropped up Florence Ada Brown and Clara Table. Now, the reason why I'm using these two photographs is because I want you all to think and get into the mindset of that our civic heroes were not born heroes, they were made or they became heroes because of what they did. And they started off just like you and I as little ones. And I think that's a particularly cute photograph of uh, Florence who looks just like my niece did when she was born. Okay. And Mary Payne Marshall, anyone familiar with Mary? Yeah. So we've got a few people who are. Um, Mary was the first woman lecturer in Cambridge University's history, lecturing on economics. It's just a shame her husband was a fragile snowflake and didn't um, acknowledge the uh, work that she had put in into his work. And so if you see lots of work by Alfred Marshall, the economist, who was a mentor to John Maynard Keynes, a large chunk of the work was actually done by his wife. It's just never properly um, acknowledged in the way that they should have been. Um, but Mary, in her later years, would be one of the librarians at the Marshall Library up on um, Sidrick Avenue. Now, the really interesting thing about this from, the, again, the British newspaper archive online, we can see here, is Mary became one of the official visitors for women in prison in Cambridge, which at the time was one of the roles that women were allowed to do 
at a time when they were banned legally from doing everything else because apparently women couldn't do those things. Um, and so the terminology I think you will often hear me using is I don't talk about women being allowed to do something because the law was changed, I use the terminology, the ban was removed. Because it makes the point that at some stage the men got together in Parliament and said, what shall we do today, chaps? Shall we improve the lives of the poor? Shall we get all of the kids going to school? No, let's ban women from doing stuff. <laughs> <coughs> because there was a lot of work to do. Anyone familiar with the Cambridge Association for the Care of Girls? Yeah. <coughs> it was one of the um, biggest and longest standing organisations um, in Cambridge, and <coughs> the main building that they had was around the back of Christchurch on Newmarket Road. <coughs> and we had some proper legends who were working on that, like I said. Lady Ida Darwin, Hester Adrian, Alice Brown, Jesse Stewart, Mary Payne, Marshall, Florence Ada Cates, the names just like that. And again, that's one of the things that I want or like the people of Cambridge to almost be that familiar with the names and the faces of all of those people who did great things. Like I said, they were all not just on the executive committee of this association, they were doing so many other things at the same time, including scrutinising the work of the local councils. Now, one of the other things too that you can see with the surnames of all of these people. Well, actually, let's think about it. Let's put that out there. What do we think of the surnames that we see there? Any observations? Again, shut them out, ladies and gents. The males are academics. So, so we've got a number of famous academics. Yes, we do. So, Ida Darwin, husband of Horace. Hester, um, Hester Adrian, who was her husband? Lord Adrian. Lord Adrian, who was Lord Adrian? <laughs> Yeah, neuroscientist and former vice chancellor of the University of Trinity. Master of Trinity. Lady Alice Bragg. Bragg Detections. Do you want to answer that? Yeah, Lady Alice Bragg. Jesse Stewart. Hugh Fraser Stewart, Dean of Trinity College Chapel and linguist as well. Mary Payne Marshall, Alfred. Florence A. Keynes, who was her husband. Neville, that's it, John Neville, who was the registrar. So, one of the things that we see with all of these is with all of the wonderful women who did great things for our cities, they also had very supportive husbands. And again, all of those husbands would have known each other. So, what we find is as well as having these very hard working and incredibly talented women, we also had a core of men who were sufficiently enlightened enough to support them and face down the chauvinism and prejudice that their wives would have had. And also at the same time, we see in the children of the couples a new generation of people coming through. <coughs> and so, like I said, the women got together in 1886, really on the back of, but I haven't found a direct link to a book that Lee Hopkins wrote, and it's called Work Amongst Working Men, published in 1884. And originally, Elise went into the Kite Barnwell, where the Grafton Centre is, and wanted to encourage all of the people there to go to church and not drink. And one thing she found was the real reasons why people weren't going to church. What do you think those reasons were? Too busy. Pumps were Pumps would have been one of them. Too busy, yet? Yeah. Um, Snobbery? No posh Who said no posh clothes? Yes. That was one of the big reasons why men in particular, working men in particular, would not go to church. Because their lives were so miserable that they were pawning their trousers that they would have worn to church at the local pawn shop to get money to go out and get drunk. And so by the time Sunday had come around, they'd spent all of their money and they'd got no trousers to go to church. And so they felt at the time, and this was a time when the wealthier people were actually renting pews. They rented, you would pay some money if you could sit at the front at church. And you know, people would think, oh, you're very good. And then you'd have all of the free seats at the back for the poor people. And 
that was pulling off a lot of people going to church. And as somebody went to church one under that, so big, I just thought, that seems strange. You know, what, was, what was that all about? And what Elise went and did was that when she wrote her book, she reported all of this back to her family and to her community who were in university high society and said, look, actually, this is what it's really like in the slums of Cambridge. And so two years later, and, and again, we see some really big names. So Mary Payne Marshall is listed here. We've also got Mrs. Sidwick. Who's Mrs. Sidwick? Henry's wife. Hmm? Henry's wife. Henry's wife. And also? Oh, Eleanor Sidwick's maiden name was Balfour. Oh. So who was her brother? Oh, yes. Arthur, the Prime Minister. Oh, and who was her uncle? Lord Salisbury, also the Prime Minister. So therefore, how influential is somebody like Eleanor Sidrick likely to be? Exactly. And so, this was really the nucleus of what was to become actually a very revolutionary society. They didn't know that at the time. They just thought they were forming a discussion society to discuss social issues such as the bringing up of corporate children, meeting at Newnham College. And the minute books were actually left by Florence A. Keynes at the Borough Library in 1942 while we were fighting for our lives. We had somebody looking out for local history while we were fighting the Nazis. And like I said, there was no talking truck. They were discussing really serious issues, such as the letter 1898, women in local government. District visiting, the improvement and the layout of towns. <laughs> Our responsibility for poverty. The National Union of Women Workers, they were talking about that in 1897. Um, and it took some time before they actually affiliated to that union and changed their name from the Cambridge Lady Discussion Society to the Cambridge branch of the National Union of Women Workers and all of the politics that went around with that. <coughs> and then we have this wonderful. <coughs> Catherine Tilliard. Anybody heard of Catherine Tilliard apart from the people who are related to Catherine Tilliard in this room? Um, that's one of the things I'm delighted that actually we've got some of the uh, relatives of some of the women that I'm featuring today in this room, uh, which uh, you know is an incredible legacy and incredible privilege, <coughs> certainly on my part, that I should be talking about their family members who have done their own town such great things. <coughs> Catherine's former mayoress of Cambridge, and uh, she spent the best part of two decades writing a weekly column in the old Cambridge Independent, which chronicles all of the local political work that the women of that time were doing. Have we got any university researchers in here, in particular those who are under the age of 30? No? Oh, we've got a few. Splendid. Um, one of the things I would love an early career researcher to do is to go through the over 500 columns that Catherine wrote and to write a report on um, basically the story of the women in those 20 years and how they influenced the Votes for Women campaign. There is an incredible story to be told, of which that is just one of them. And, like I said, somebody could really make their names for themselves by analysing and going through them uh, in detail. Because the columns, the newspaper columns, are all sitting in the Cambridgeshire collection waiting for somebody to go through them. And then this wonderful woman turns up. This is Edmund Tyler here, founder of Save Children. And um, what can I say about this? hero of Cambridge. Um, she arrived in Cambridge after completing a degree in modern history at Lady Margaret Hall in Oxford. Tried out teaching for years and um, her mum said, you don't like it so you're going to come and live with me in Cambridge because we're living in Cambridge here with Sir Richard and uh, Lady Caroline. <coughs> and, you know, nice happy family together. 
she was incredibly beautiful. And we were very lucky um, in the past year to find, again in the Cambridgeshire collection, the Palmer Park Art by Glass Plates collection of over 40,000 glass plate negatives. And the Cambridge Family History Society went and transcribed in a spreadsheet the entire card index of all of those 40,000 records. So when I found that they had done that, I just went and searched through the records and I commissioned the Cambridgeshire collection to get Disparate and a whole host of others printed off. And then I went to a digital restorer to <coughs> get the photograph restored and then just play with colorizing the image. Um, and I've used the description of Eglin Simon from Claire Murray's excellent biography to inform what the colour of her hair, the colour of her eyes and skin um, would look like. And her eyes and her hair just jump out. I tried desperately to get hold of an expert in um, fashion history at the time but couldn't, so I just said to, to Nick, just play around with the colours and see what works for now. And then hopefully, as time goes by, somebody who is an expert in Victorian and Edwardian fashion, perhaps say, well, actually, this is what the colour scheme is likely to have been. This is what the jewellery colour is, is, is likely to um, have been. But I think, for me, that's actually part of the fun of doing this sort of research, is that it takes it away from just the history books, and it allows you to actually use artistic license um, to get wider audiences involved, to say it's not just about dry text. And so, um, Evelyn Tyne's first publication, after she had a heartbreak, unfortunately, um, was this one. Um, Florence Ed Keynes and Mary Payne Marshall said, if you had your heart broken, we need to get you doing something useful. And so she went around the whole of Cambridge and created this register of every single charitable organisation in town. And it's an incredible thing. And is um, the first document of its type um, in the town's history. And she played to that for all of us. And it's in the Cambridgeshire collection, it's in a very tatty state, which is why I digitised it and saved it. Because if the building goes up in flames, we've lost it. And I think that would be a very sad thing. So I've digitised it and I've put it on the Internet Archive. So if you search for the Cambridge Register on archive.org, you can find it. She then published this book. And this is it. 1906. <coughs> Cambridge, a brief study in social questions, not a brief study at all. <laughs> it's over 200 pages. And it was in here that um, I found the uh, statistic about one pub every 25 metres, which is astonishing. But the really lovely thing, I think, as a historian, is that the first two chapters are all about the history of Cambridge between 1800 and 1900. And for about 30 pages, it's just basically Cambridge today, yesterday, and the beginnings of New Cambridge. But the issues she identifies are occupations and trade, want of employment, health and temperance. We had a massive temperance movement here. Imagine 5,000 people rocking up on Parker's Peaks, basically saying, ban alcohol. <laughs> That's what we were doing in the um, early 1900s. Because we were permanently drunk, employment and leisure. She was one of the first people to actually say, actually, people and the working classes need more leisure time. Talking about higher education, work amongst boys, work amongst girls, she and Margaret Keynes, Florence's daughter, um, actually ran a labour exchange for um, teenage boys and girls to get them into work and to get them off the streets. Charitable work, religious work, how to help, how to give for people, saying how to get involved in making our town a better place. I think that's incredible. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> And she didn't do it alone because she had people such as Mrs. J.J. Thompson. Does that name sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. Splendid. Uh, Mrs. Rackham, who at the time, Mrs. Clara Rackham, who wrote all about the Cambridge Cooperative Society, it used to be one of the biggest societies in Cambridge at one time in the 1930s. One person in every five in town was a member. And then they spent all of their money on the Beehive Centre and went bust. <laughs> and we lost her. Which is a too real tragedy, I think. Um, Mrs. Alfred Marshall, Mrs. Haynes, again, the two pillars of 
this Cambridge Charitable Organisation Society. Today we call that organisation the Cambridge Citizens Advice Bureau. Which legacy. Miss Gwendolyn Darwin, this is one of the things that we find is that all of these people knew each other, we had great families. The Darwins, the Keynes and the Jebs are the three that really stand out. So this is Gwen Darwin as a very, very young teenager. And Rachel, if I can ask you to just come up here and help me with this. Because this is actually a very, very fragile map. Just hold, hold that for me. So what this is, and this is what Gwen, who would later become a very famous woodcut artist, one of her first pieces of work was this, and this map. And this is a rent map of the rents across Cambridge Town at the time. This is one of the first examples of data mapping in Cambridge Town's history. And so, thank you. And so, this book is ever so significant because it is the first social scientific study of poverty and multiple deprivation in Cambridge's history. Before that, the clerics and the academics saw Cambridge's problems with poverty and multiple, <coughs> de multiple deprivation was caused by ladies with loose morals. The spinning house. Which was where the vice chancellor would unlawfully throw women that he and the proctors thought were sex workers into prison, but it was 17-year-old Daisy Hopkins who said, please don't do that. And with the support of Town Doing a Whip Round, won, a, uh, won the support of the Home Secretary, amongst other people, to get the law changed in 1894. And so what Eglantine and friends did with this was they comprehensively busted that myth that poverty and multiple deprivation was the fault of women. It wasn't. It was poor public health and poor town planning, and they comprehensively demonstrated that in this book. And they followed it up in 1908 with a progress report to say, councillors, can we have a progress check, please? And that's one of the reasons why it's ever so important to go after people like Councillor Herbert here to say, how are we doing? Because what we were seeing was the interaction between local councillors and the women at the time remembering that in 1907, there was actually a change in law. Now, one of the things that women were able to do from the early 1900s was they were able to serve on the boards of education because it was one of the things that they just couldn't do, bringing up young children and all that. And so at the time, got herself co-opted onto the board of education for Cambridge Borough Council. And so she was on that committee that voted to build a school in Melbourne Place. Today we call that Parkside. She also attended this uh, conference at The Hague, which was a series of new peace conferences designed to stop the world getting to war. It didn't work, but she was years ahead of her time, basically saying, actually, let's get representatives from all over the world to get together and say, how can we reduce the risk of these big conflicts? Now, she became very good friends and a uh, romantic partner with Margaret Keynes. Um, it's a fascinating piece of research by, um, by Claire Mully in her biography. Because Edmund Tyne originally fell in love with Marcus Dimsdale, who decided to go off with um, with Elspeth Phillips, who I think is actually quite a tragic figure, um, not in the pejorative sense, but in that she worked her socks off for the Cambridgeshire Liberal Party, ultimately standing for Parliament, but she never got elected. And her husband, Marcus, uh, again, happy to her life in 1920. <coughs> Elspeth still kept on going, but just seems to have been forgotten and just written out. And I think that's sad, so that's one of the reasons why I've included her in there, because I think there is a story for those of you in particular who are in the Lib Dems or are interested in the history of Cambridge Liberals to actually tell Elspeth's story. Margaret, in that fantastically talented family of the Keyneses, um, 
would go on to marry um, Archibald Hill, who was a Nobel Pink Nobel Peace Prize. It's not, sorry, a Nobel Prize for um, even maybe small physics, I forget, off the top of my head. But he was a very good marksman. And so when World War I broke out, um, the uh, Cambridge Regiment basically said, can you help us with target practice? <laughs> And he was so good at helping people with uh, the soldiers with target practice that Sir Horace Darwin, who was um, working with the government to deal with these new threats coming from the air, zeppelins and planes, basically said, "Okay, can you help us shoot these things down?" And so Archibald Hill and Sir Horace Darwin went off to work for central government to develop the UK's first anti-aircraft capability. How cool is that? Um, Margaret would become a house and companion, and she has a an estate named after the Margaret Hill Estate, a housing association named after her, and got a CBE for her troubles. Now, coming back to 1908, this is when the law was changed to remove the ban on unmarried women who owned property and were thus paying local property rates from, for, from standing for election and saying more than Florence and a list that goes all the way down of people signed it. And it was, what's really interesting is that you see couples signing it. And here you can see the master of Selwyn and Mrs. Appleton signing. And there were at least three college masters and their wives who were signing and co-signing that letter. Edmund Times was also a signatory of that. Various people in the Darwin family were signing that. And as a result, Rosalind Philpott and Julia Kennedy were the first two women to stand for election in Cambridge that year. Unfortunately, they didn't get elected because the people of Cambridge said, or the men of Cambridge said, no, we need businessmen. But this is the real untold story of Eglantine Jeffers, that she was a liberal activist in Cambridge. She was party political, as in properly party political, and the newspapers at the time, and this is Catherine Tilliard talking her. Uh, about her. She was the head of the National League of Young Liberals in Cambridge. She was the person who started the Young Liberals in Cambridge, which is quite splendid. And furthermore, <coughs> she was going around town giving public lectures, taking part in debates, basically saying we need land reform, we need a minimum wage. When did we get the latest, the most recent minimum wage? It was under a Labour government, wasn't it? Yeah. There was Edelman time Jeff called for a minimum wage over a century before, which is quite incredible. Um, it wasn't just Edelman time was a liberal activist, it was this chap. Are we familiar with Rupert Brooke? Yes. Yes, of course we're familiar with Rupert Brooke. <coughs> this is Rupert Brooke calling for the democratisation of our land. He's calling for the nationalisation of the land in this speech that he gave to Cambridge Fabian Society in 1910 in a lecture called sort of Democracy and the Arts. It was transcribed by Sir Geoffrey Keynes, the younger son of Florence A. Keynes, and so I've digitized it and put it up online basically to demonstrate that Rupert Brooke was not conservative in the way that people think he is. He was a radical. And we know that because Sir Geoffrey is was the literary trustee or one of the trustees of Rupert Brooke's estate because they were close friends at university. And I got hold of one of the books, and this is the account of Rupert Brooks driving around his um, local constituency, getting liberal voters to the ballot boxes, but the Tories had more cars and more drivers, and so the Tories won that constituency, and finished with a word, basically saying, I hate the upper classes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, we come to Grantstone for the year 2006, and Geoffrey Archer, the famous former Conservative MP decided to invite Margaret Thatcher to unveil the statue of Rupert Brooke, who said, I hate the upper classes. <laughs> <coughs> I love history. Mm. Um, we're doing for time. Crikey. Um, so, yeah, the Liberals, unfortunately, in came to crash and burned. Stanley Buckmaster, who was um, very briefly the Member of Parliament for Cambridge in 1906-1910. He later became the Lord Chancellor and helped remove the ban on women working as lawyers. Again, notes the um, terminology. He lost to Ulmerich Pages, who later was Baron Queensborough, basically said, Frank and Hitler are splendid chaps. He was beaten by a scoundrel. 
War breaks out, Florence gets elected because Florence persuaded the government that they should also remove the ban on married women standing for election. Um, because in those days, it was a property qualification. As soon as you got married, if you were a woman, you ceased to be a property owner. Um, within weeks of that ban being removed, we basically said, Florence, can you stand for election? And we elected her. Um, war happened. And Florence, as the chair of the Women's Labour Exchange in Cambridge, got lots of people, lots of women, out of their houses, taking part in the war effort. And it's all chronicled in 1919, basically saying, this is the work that the women of Cambridge did. Come on. And even more work. Cleaning windows, working for the county council. And again, this is what I mean by it was a big game changer, and Florence made it happen. Um, even more, Florence got together with women at St. Columbus Hall opposite John Lewis and basically said, right, let's get involved in international politics. And when the law was changed, again, it was Buckmaster who was behind this, women were able to stand for becoming magistrates. Mrs. Keynes, Bethany Baker, Jane Harrison, Leah Manning, Clara Rackham all became the first magistrates, women magistrates in Cambridge's history. They were able to jail people. <laughs> Annie Carnegie Brown. It was Maud Darwin who, during the First World War, basically said, we need women police officers, not least to protect women. Annie was our first. And as you can see, became quite successful because she ultimately became a sergeant. And quite interestingly here, on Midsummer, at Midsummer Fair, she arrested me for tune teller. Basically saying, you can't sell for tune teller to preach the vagrancy act. Um, and the uh, suspect pleaded guilty and she got a prosecution. Clara Rackham, another pillar of um, Cambridge, who started off work uh, against the poor laws, a pillar of the Cambridge and District Cooperative um, Society, and also, as you can see here, talking about town planning with Mr. Ebenezer Howard. Does that name ring any bells? Yes. Garden City Movement. Yes. And again, in the chair, councillor, Mrs. Keynes. We fast forward to the Romsey Labour Club. Now, one of the untold stories of the Romsey Labour Club as an institution was it was a very young academic a very talented academic called Helen Tan, who contributed financially but not very publicly to the construction of that club which was built by Voluntary Labour. <coughs> Helen would later become the first woman professor to be appointed at the University of Harvard some 30 years later. And when the official history to commemorate the death of Queen Victoria um, was written, she was the person who wrote 150 pages of Cambridge's official history, while the chaps of all of the colleges decided up the college histories between them and ignored the town. That's why Helen's way. Eglantine's final visit, I just love the quotation um, that she has at the end, um, basically saying she expressed her indebtedness to Cambridge, saying she felt that everything she knew and the ideals she held she owed to Cambridge, and she never came back to Cambridge without receiving fresh inspiration. It's not a wonderful line to leave off from before she went off to Geneva and to the League of Nations. Just as we lost England time, a little second called Florence arrives on the scene from the United States after having campaigned to end the First World War and called for a world government, a world federation. Um, and when she got here, it was a time right, okay, we've got to sort out Cambridge, and her contribution was this book. Birth Control and Trial. And she founded the first birth control clinic in Cambridge's history in the slums of Barnwell, and got the King's Surgeon to be the patron of it. And then in 1930, she interviewed the first 300 surface users, and that's the result of it, published in 1930. It's an incredible read, and again, I would love a professional researcher to go through that and, and publicise the conclusions from it. One of the big things I can take away from having gone through it is that the withdrawal method was surprisingly common as the main means of contraception. It's free. It's 
<laughs> doesn't cost anything. And that was before, obviously, the pill in the, the 1960s. But all of the social issues that stem from that, including the failure rates as well, and what would happen, um, and how families dealt with that, are all dealt with um, in that book. And which is why for me it's so significant, because it's about the history of the working class in Cambridge, which is ever so easily forgotten. Yes, Eva Hartree. Um, I asked um, Mr. Harris to colorize this. And um, by the way, if anyone does need to shoot off at two, that's that's fine, because I realise I'm running absolutely late. Um, Eva became our first woman mayor of Cambridge. Quite controversial, actually, because the Tories didn't want her. <laughs> Just like no, anyone should be the first woman mayor. It should be Florence, but women shouldn't be mayors anyway because we're conservatives. Um, and some of the stuff that's in the Cambridge Chronicle is just so astonishingly sexist, it's quite eye-watering. Um, but uh, she had to deal with all of these people rocking up to her house, basically saying, please don't build a bus station on the street. And actually, several hundred of them were there at her house um, on Trumpington Road. And she was just like, what am I going to do with 300 working men who are all moaning at me outside my front door? Um, but she managed to talk them around and basically say, I'm just the mayor of Cambridge, I do as directed by the councillors, it's their fault, but come to the next council meeting and discuss your case. But in the end, we got Drummer Street. The other alternative would have been on Midsummer Common. But Eva Hartree made sure that we didn't have a riot over it, which, given our past, <laughs> Riots throughout the 1800s it was actually quite a significant achievement. Lee Manning. Dame Lee Manning, MP. This is her autobiography, a cracking read. Um, taught at Homerton College, and I just want to read this extract of what happened when she was a teacher ending up at one of the big slums in Cambridge at the New Street School which now is owned by this university as a music therapy centre. And basically, one of the girls in her class died because of malnutrition. And when the doctor was called, she says, and I quote, on the stairs, blinded by tears, I banged into someone coming up. It was her doctor. Hey, steady on, he said. I'm giving you a little chapman. You're a big girl. He looked up at my streaming eyes. What's up? He asked. That little girl, Mary, you won't let her die, I gulped. If that little girl were as strong as you, she might have a chance, but she's undernourished and she has no strength to fight, he said sadly. Then you put it on. You put the truth on her death certificate. I shouted, glaring at him. Died from starvation. And pushing past him, I rushed out into the street. And um, that actually was then reported to the local trade union, and she almost got sacked for it. Because the council couldn't deal with the scandal, but Florida Kane's actually been on the Board of Education, actually <laughs> talked them out of it. Frieda Stewart. Frieda was a musician, daughter of Hugh Fraser and Jesse Stewart. Went to the first, fell ill, saw the rise of fascism when, uh, when she convalesced in Europe, and then went to the northern towns, um, actually in Hull, and like I said, wrote, uh, um, or basically took, brought up to the slums of Hull. And the writer of that concert was just incredible. And that's a photograph from a book called Rosie's War of Frida um, in her very early 20s. And somehow they got involved in the Spanish Civil War. Um, and that's her mum, Jessie, there, with a big lorry, Cambridge to Barcelona, help to send war because we were a proper anti-fascist little town and we didn't like those people, what they were doing in, a, um, in Spain or Italy. And Frida drove herself an ambulance full of medical supplies from London to Spain. In the 1930s? In the 1930s. Wow. Which is quite incredible. Um, and while that was happening, Leo Manning, having lost her seat in Parliament, also went to Spain to see what was going on. And it's, again, described in her book. And this is a telegram to Clement Attlee, otherwise known as Major Attlee at the time, basically saying, we are being bombed by racist Nazis. 
please help, we're trying to get all of the children out. And she actually managed that, didn't we? The British point in order to get a ship with 4,000 children sailing from Bilbao to here. And some of those children actually sailed here. Um, in the meantime, Florence becomes our second woman mayor of Cambridge and says, let's sort out this Guildhall problem. Could I have a Guildhall at Parkside, where the fire station and the police station are? But she said no. Um, King Henry gave us the site where it currently is, we are staying. Um, problem was, nobody could agree what to decide for the Guildhall. Could we have a Gothic design, a Doric design, Norman? Possibly even a Tudor one, or a real modern one. No, let's just have a mix of them all. This is by Sylvian in 1935. There's a lamp <laughs> Everything to do with the guilt. Now, he's lampooning it again in the middle of the council debates. They were trying to uh, keep building and knocking things down. You can see it was actually built in sections. It was just a complete mess. And everyone was just laughing at the councillors. And again, Sid Mooney, um, again, basically saying, you know, miserable creature, over my dead body, will you build that offensive monstrosity? <laughs> and it led to this huge meeting at Guildhall. There were over 2,000 people were there. I don't think there's many of that. But as you can see, it's like standing room only. The balcony at the top is also full. And I think this shadow here is basically Florence Higgins <coughs> in her mid to late 70s, basically saying, and then you chaps come out with a unified design as an alternative, we're carrying on building it. And so, we got the guild hall that we have today. In the meantime, Frida Stewart, who was in Spain, fled the country and ended up in France. And then the Nazis invaded and she got captured and got thrown into a prison pen. And she says she doesn't know what she was thinking other than it will take six months for the Nazis to get to Paris, by which time she'd have completed her course with the Sabana and would be able to go home again. But the Nazis got there in six weeks. Now, she got interned, it wasn't a uh, worth it experience, and she wrote it in a wonderful little book, which I got a copy of and then deposited in the Cambridgeshire collection, so you can actually read it um, in her own words. Um, so she was interned by the Nazis, and the conditions were horrible, acting properly rotten. Bug infected barracks built in the early 1800s. It was not pleasant. And yet, there were people from all over the world who were interned. <laughs> Paris being an international city, and the Germans not really discriminating. <laughs> not um, basically anyone who wasn't white and German or white and Aryan would just get thrown in there, and anyone who was also uh, English or British as well. Now the really strange thing was not only the conditions absolutely horrible, but they came across an English woman who was so racist, even the Nazis were shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Frida befriended a Nigerian lady called Ronka, and they stumbled across an English woman who basically said, I will not even be in the same room as that person over there, because of the colour of her skin. And the uh, Nazi authorities were just like, what? You know, We've got these swastikas on hand, we're the lowest of the lower, you're someone else. And so, um, Frida had a minor disagreement with the said individual, because Frida was a proper communist by this stage. And so you can imagine those two women absolutely hated each other, the English upper class woman and Frida. And so they had to be separated. Um, but she escaped. Frida escaped. She and her friend, Rosemary Say, who act, whose um, stories have actually been written up, walked out of a hole in the fence. And they managed to cross from northern France to southern France, through Spain, through Portugal, to the Republic of Ireland, and back to the UK. And guess what they got for their troubles from the Foreign Office? Did they get a medal? No. What would they have got if they had been British heroes from Eton? <laughs> exactly. No, they got a bill for the airfare. <laughs> Not only did they get a bill for the air fare, they also had special branch on them for the remainder of the war and after. So this is um, from Frieda's Secret Service file. <coughs> Classified. No, I meant to not copy of it. And as you can say, Frieda has been running a puppet political show around the villages of Cambridge. 
for the last week and has played the Messiah Convolving Title uh, rehearsals. Now, I think Councillor Herbert will find that quite funny in terms of somebody running around town with a puppet for political purposes. Excuse <laughs> so, those of you who follow me on Twitter around Excuse us. Like I said, nearly 75, and we've missed out all of these people. So, I want, what I wanted to do, and I'm just going to quickly go through these, is to say, can you away there? If we want to, can, don't worry. Um, if we want to commemorate the women, how can we do that? And uh, I said, some of my ideas include expanding the Museum of Cambridge, rebuilding the old Victorian courthouse that was there that we turned into a car park. Mm. Uh, or rather, the county council turned it into a car park despite the opposition from the city council. said, no, please leave it alone. Um, <laughs> working <laughs> progress as we discussed earlier. <laughs> Building a big new concert hall, mm. and basically on the site on Harvey Road, opposite where Florence said the Kensington family used to live. And getting some big murals. That mural, I contacted the artist and he said it's about £8,000 to get a big mural like that created. We've got the photographs and the materials, and he could easily do something like that. But it would need all of you to lobby your councillors to say, can we get something like that done and identify a site? For those of you who need to go now, feel free to go. Um, we do have actually a very, uh, very special treatment for you. What I'll do is 